China is the world's biggest emitter of CO2. It says it intends to take robust action on climate change. Not everyone believes it. And it's still building coal plants. So the question's an obvious one. What's going on? Is China serious about climate change or not? Well, let's have a look. If you believe in decarbonising the world's energy, then you have to deal with the challenge of getting a global consensus for action. Getting a national consensus is kind of hard enough on anything, but particularly on a question that is going to possibly transform aspects of how we live. Now, China looms large in that equation, and it has for some time, certainly since it became the world's largest emitter of CO2 as its economy developed once it abandoned economic communism. It loomed large as well as a stick that American politicians who didn't want to take the agenda seriously could wield. Here we are talking about reducing emissions, yet China, under the Paris Accords, are going to be increasing their emissions by nearly 50% five gigatons annually. So, so while in the United States, we need to continue investing in innovative solutions and exporting clean energy technologies, it makes no sense for us to be doing it if we're simply watching for increases in, in China. And it also loomed large because although it was a poor argument for complacency, what they said, they nevertheless kind of had a point. Tackling global climate change only works if the action is global. If you have a river being polluted, telling the smaller companies that they need to stop polluting while ignoring the major corporation downstream whose output is enough on its own to kill all the fish, well, you get the idea. China, of course, said that it recognises climate change. It signed up to the Paris Agreement, albeit with few constraints, just future promises. And it's easy to be cynical. Some people said, and because there's always a few people who comment on videos without watching the video first, I bet there'll be one or two in the comments below who say this. There's no way China will cripple its own economy with this agenda. They're just playing everyone for fools. But then China surprised a few people by coming out and saying that it would peak CO2 emissions by 2030 and it would work to achieve net zero emissions by 2060. Now, those are solid commitments and ambitious in face of the status quo. In other words, we should be able to tell quickly whether China's actions are in line with its stated intentions or not. But also, if you pay attention to all the context and the evidence, you have to remember that China, more strategically than most, is always playing a longer geopolitical game. Western countries tend to suggest you can separate these things out. They'll say things like, we're really concerned about China. They're trying to undermine our position in the world and to take power for themselves. And we won't let their companies run our 5G network and all sorts of other things. But we can work together with them on climate change, where we have an interest in common. Well, there's no evidence that China splits those two things out. All of these elements are things that it looks to exploit to its advantage. So we should look at that context too in this video. But let's look at where we are actually on climate change. Today, China accounts for around 30% of the world's CO2 emissions. It represents half of all coal use overall and half of the coal-fired power stations for electricity. And this is not just a legacy. China built more than 38 gigawatts of new coal-fired power plants in 2020, which represented three quarters of new coal construction globally. Because it still has the political mechanics of communism, the centrally planned state, even if it's embraced the market economy, it creates the same sort of five-year plans that Stalin initiated in the Soviet Union. Last week saw the conclusion of a week-long annual meeting of the National People's Congress of China, where it formalised the outline for the next five-year plan and its long-term targets for 2035. For the first time, it did not set an economic growth target, something that some environmentalists welcomed as a break from the growth-at-all-costs mentality. Well, more likely it's a recognition of the unintended consequences of previous targets, which were met by local governments investing in big projects financed by loans. Ultimately, not a sustainable approach, because sooner or later all of those loans add up and they become a drag on the economy. 
on climate specifically in the five-year plan, it set a target for 18% reduction of CO2 intensity and a 13.5% reduction target for energy intensity from 2021 to 2025. So that's not specific emissions target. It's saying that every unit of output will be achieved with less CO2, so it will be more efficient. Emissions will grow if the output significantly grows, but they'll grow a lot less than if the efficiency improvements hadn't been made. Energy intensity has been driven down by successive five-year plans, so it's been a consistent area of focus so far this century. Also, for the first time, the outline refers to China's longer-term climate goals and introduces the idea of a CO2 emissions cap which you would use to start bringing down total emissions. It didn't at this stage go so far as to set that cap. There have been a number of reactions to this outcome. Commentators in Vox, for instance, said that the 2025 targets were not, in their view, compatible with making the progress the country had set for 2030. For one thing, they wanted to know when China was actually going to reach peak emissions. By 2030 could mean 2022, or it could mean 2029, and it rather makes a difference to how quickly the rest follows. Others have pointed to an important aspect of the Chinese government and the nation in recent history, which is that they have a history of over-delivering on their targets. So, for instance, this graph shows the CO2 intensity targets from the last two five-year plans and how they were exceeded by the actual performance, along with an estimate for this time's plan. And that's an interesting thing, isn't it? In democratic nations, we're used to, maybe a bit sick of, to be fair, but resigned to, nonetheless, politicians promising big and then under-delivering. On all sides of the various political divides, that much tends to be consistent. Big talk, small action. Personally, it drives me crazy, probably you as well. Authoritarian countries can be prone to it as well. They just don't always know whether or not they're under-delivering. Under Chairman Mao, China blundered into the Great Famine because the top leadership made big promises of increased output that were physically impossible to deliver. And because it could be a life-ending process, everyone was too scared to send bad news back up the line. So everyone pretended the targets were being not just met but exceeded, and tens of millions of people starved before a member of a top leadership who actually cared about it finally had it brought to his attention. China has learned many lessons since then, and has become a new kind of authoritarian system in recent history anyway. One that was a bit smarter, a bit more realistic, and a bit more careful. So we may now see a system where everyone's learned that you have to have the freedom to promise low so that you can deliver high. Everyone conspires to set easy targets because the penalty for not achieving those targets is bad. The alternative view would be that they continue to fail to meet the targets, but everyone covers up. It'd be surprising if under a system where failure is punished, that didn't still happen in some places. But in the modern world, it's harder than ever to avoid knowledge of those failures becoming known. So it must be less of a factor than it was in Mao's time. The danger, of course, is that the culture of setting yourself easy targets means that you don't push yourself to do as much as you need to do. Dr. Fukiang Yang, a, an expert on energy and climate in China, says that while appreciating the political culture that means the top policymakers do not make promises they can't deliver, nevertheless, they need to set more ambitious targets and show more daring, which is an understandable argument. But, and as Dr. Yang acknowledges, with the top-down authoritarian model, you can end up straight back in the pain of those early Maoist lessons. So in the previous five-year plan, the one that's just gone, China pushed harder in one area. It introduced a dual control policy that demanded that energy intensity should be reduced by 15% by the end of the period. The policy also said that total energy consumption should stay under 5 billion tonnes of coal equivalent. That was then divided and broken down into goals for the individual areas. But the central bureaucrats were few in number and the workload was heavy, so many of the provinces found that the goals handed down to them were unrealistic. But of course, such messages don't get heard or accepted or even transmitted. So for instance, Zhejiang province to the south of Beijing had to cut off electricity toward the end of 2020 to achieve its goal, forcing factories to close, leaving people without winter heating. 
Dr Yang believes that the government may have learned from this and that the carbon cap, when it comes, will be formulated to be bottom up rather than top down. So the provinces will set their own targets, which will then be aggregated into a national carbon cap. Which would mean that you have a system that delivers on its goals, but again, every province would have an easy to hit target set because they have no incentive to be ambitious. This is the sort of problem, by the way, where as with reducing the sulphur emissions that caused acid rain, the US President George H.W. Bush established tradable emission permits that allowed those who could reduce more easily to sell their permits to those that couldn't. That's a bit too free market and not enough five-year plan for the Chinese government at this point, I would rather expect. That can also end up playing towards the game of when carbon peak emissions will come. Dr. Jia Pan said this to an academic seminar on the subject early this year. Recently, a top official told me that carbon peaks are not difficult to achieve. If we built a batch of high carbon projects during the 14th five-year plan and the 15th five-year plan periods, then stopped afterwards, won't we easily achieve a carbon peak that way? Now, when you get short-term goals divorced from the point of what the goals are supposed to achieve like that, you have the evidence of a system that's producing perverse incentives. And perverse incentives operate at multiple levels. China has an incentive to be a fully engaged part of the global effort on climate change, but to do so in a way that gets maximum credit while also giving itself the maximum freedom and flexibility to achieve its economic goals. Hence, it sets efficiency targets and talks about the timing of the peak, which leaves all sorts of room for manoeuvre because they're not talking about total emissions. And then the people on the ground follow the incentives the state puts in front of them. They're not incentivised to care about what happens in 2060. They're incentivised to meet a carbon intensity target next year. That's the binding target that they will lose their job over if they don't meet. It's not that the ambitions necessarily are cautious in every area. Central planning has many, and I mean many, faults as a system, but it can push to scale quite quickly when a decision has been made. Now, not always a good thing, as Mao discovered when he pushed to scale the drive to kill sparrows and discovered belatedly what a useful service they provided in the killing of the pests that devastated their crops. But that comes down to the wisdom of the targets that you set for yourself. So China has clearly determined that it wants to be a world leader in the technologies of tomorrow. And that means the zero carbon technologies. For example, electric vehicles. Beijing has poured more than $100 billion into the electric vehicle sector and is pushing another $120 billion in 2021 on self-driving car technology. It's also invested heavily in all the manufacturing elements that support that ambition. It's spending billions to take control of cobalt supplies in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where, according to the Diplomat website, it controls eight of the largest 14 cobalt mines. It controls 70% of the world's lithium supply. And as a result, more than twice as many electric vehicles have been sold in China than in the United States. The top two Chinese companies in the area control a third of the global battery market between them. And it's not just cars. 420,000 electric buses operate already in China, as opposed to 1,000 in the US. You will often see leaders in the West boasting about how much they lead the world on new technology. Sometimes it's true. Usually it's hubris, because rarely are companies or countries really willing to commit what it takes to be true world leaders. And you can see this playing out as well in nuclear. China is actively working on improving fourth generation nuclear technology to the point where it can be a real force. While countries in the West are worrying about the cost, China can say, we don't care because we have a resource to throw into this and then we'll make the money back by selling it back to the world. And people worry about the risk and China can say, we don't care because firstly, we think it can be managed and secondly, we don't have to pay attention to what our citizens think. We tell them what to think and mostly they do which is why they, as well as Russia, by the way, have been able to engage in vaccine diplomacy, offering vaccines to countries in a strategically smart way, even while their own population has less than 2% vaccinated. You may not want to live in a society like that, 
I know I don't, but you shouldn't underestimate what it can achieve. And while plenty of people focus on China's continuing expansion of coal, you can miss the fact that its strong economic growth means that it's been doing all that coal stuff and becoming the biggest investor in clean generation, nuclear and renewables in the world. The five-year plan includes a target for non-fossil fuels to make up around 20% of China's energy mix by 2025. It's currently around 16%. Now, that said, according to China Dialogue, that target has moved for this time's plan out of the binding targets section being placed instead in the main text of the plan. It's suggested that this difference may affect how the target is viewed because the stated binding targets are naturally getting more rigorous scrutiny. But there's no doubt that the development of the technology is a high priority, even if the exact percentage spread of the energy mix in China's own energy supply is still open to variation. There's a big geopolitical component in this. China is putting itself into leadership positions in the world for its own longer term benefit. Now, it has been rocked on its heels by the controversy over the pandemic and the growing hostility towards it that started with, but clearly isn't ending with, Trump. But those things change the short term calculations, not the longer term goal. There is also the other longer term factor, which is that there's every sign that China accepts the science of climate change and sees adaptation to the zero carbon agenda as essential to its well-being. Why does it take climate change so seriously? Because it knows that it has been particularly vulnerable to climate change. Throughout its history, negative periods of climate have hit China frequently and with devastating consequences to the point where they were the catalyst that brought down great dynasties. There are two aspects of their history they carry with them keenly. That's one. And the other is the sense that for over a century, China was humiliated by being dominated and ruled over by Western powers from the Opium Wars onwards. Context matters. How people view their nationhood is shaped by these things. And how a growing power sees its opportunities can also be shaped by the memory of those things. The thing we really don't know is how it all plays out. China can still be undermined by the flaws in its political system. Xi Jinping has risen as a break from the recent past, taking more central power to himself, removing the requirement for him to step down after a set term. Individuals who embrace absolute power almost always become their own worst enemy. It may take a while, but it's pretty inevitable unless something happens to overturn them. For now... Analysts say that China could absolutely achieve its goals given what we currently know. A study from last year reviewed the scenarios for how China would reach net zero by 2060 and concluded that an 18 to 20 percent reduction of CO2 intensity in the coming five year period would be compatible with that trajectory. In the meantime, this is only the outline plan and more details on energy and climate will be announced later this year. So how that pans out, we have yet to see. Is it job done? China in the bag if you focus on global climate change? No, too many variables, too many factors at play to take that for granted. Not least how the context of all this may be affected by the other geopolitical tussles going on between China and the West. If some of those get really sticky in global political terms, it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that China will halt its progress in this area specifically to put pressure on the global community who's desperate for it to continue. However, right now, its progress seems to have more solid momentum behind it than the US, which has to disentangle its approach to this area from the ideological battles that it has going on. And someone at some point needs to mention the word India, which is in a completely other zone altogether.